But there was something about Alex that he made his mark on everybody, but nobody knows he made his mark on them. There was just something about his comics. He was able to simplify his really dynamic drawings down into as few lines as possible. It does something to me inside where it goes, okay, that's the way it's got to be done. I mean, I can remember seeing Herculoids in Space Ghost and just being struck by the design. Toth is always referred to as the, the artist's artist. He was a real contradiction in terms. He could be the sweetest guy, he could be a real jerk. Alex liked lots of people, but there, there are certain people that he butted heads with. We were buddies, we were friends, I thought. I was always on my toes, or you, you felt like you had to be because he expected so much from you. He was always known for, uh, for having a bit of a temper. He was like a granddaddy who spanked you for not wetting your pants properly. He was a jerk, he was being a jerk. <laughs> It was his fault, I swear. He would like to argue points, but at the same time, he would get frustrated and just say, no, I'm right, you're wrong, go away. He told me I spoke like a valley girl and something else, very nice and flattering, and hung up the phone, and I don't think I talked to him for a year or two. People just loved him. They loved his artwork. But uh, something inside of him wouldn't, couldn't enjoy it. He was always searching, searching, drawing these sketches, those little sketches. Everything about him was to, to strive for simplicity. Dear you, just ended my phone call to you, and myriad thoughts have come forth since. So let's lay them out. Born, half past midnight, 25 June 1928, to Sandor and Mary Elizabeth Toth, who could ill afford the event, but made the best of it with their only child. And so I remained. I miss the New York City of my youth which both has gone and went. I miss walking anywhere, everywhere, without fear, day or night, discovering all the odd and interesting bits of New York City just around the next corner, or in that shop there, and, and the people. The park, my dog, Milky, the rowboat lake on a summer day, LaGuardia's east side swimming pools on the East River in 77th, bike rentals, roller skating, slipping on ice, crunching new snow underfoot, smelling roasting chestnuts as you walk down the corner of 59th and Lex, where the old guy sold them in front of Bloomingdale's. The sight and sound and riding on 3rd Avenue trolleys, the L trains as they rattled along, all windows up in summer, girls in summer's white dresses and sun pink faces, old 42nd Street, Broadway, for long aimless walks, the smell of the smoked meat in the Hungarian pork store, Myrtles, 79th and 2nd. I think Dad, you know, he liked to use the whole Hungarian thing to describe something bigger. The thing is, um, Dad's dad, he was actually a house painter, um, <clears throat> but he was very passionate, a little wild sometimes, <laughs> and he enjoyed the nightlife. And I think singing was really his passion and what he really wanted to do. And it described a whole vibe about him and the way he grew up. And, you know, even when we were kids and we would go to Grandma's house, she always made Hungarian food. He loved it. And um, that was really solely what she cooked. Mm -hmm. I mean, That's she really she did, did, always. She up until the, cash. Mm -hmm, Up until the day she but died. His father also wrote and produced plays. Um, he had a little radio show, so he dabbled in a little bit of everything. I mean, he, he did whatever, I mean, multi-talented guy. But his unresolved musical and theatrical ambitions frustrated him throughout his sad life. My mom would doodle pretty girl profiles and nothing else but. And watching her must have led me to copying them and later to drawing my own though the Sunday funnies, comic books, and afternoons spent listening to daily radio adventure serials helped a lot, I'm sure, to fire my imagination. My poster class teacher in junior high took time to argue that I had to go to high school in industrial arts and make art my craft. With portfolio, I spent afternoons pestering comic book editors, art directors, and Artist heroes, Meskin, Cole, 
fine. Robbins, for critiques. Then at 15, I was hired by Steve Douglas at Famous Funnies and worked full time at the board. Shelley Mayer hired me at DC in 1947. He was a very young artist coming into the DC stable. I think Shelley Mayer is his first editor. I think Shelley saw a real promise in the stuff that he did. And he ended up becoming pretty good friends with Erwin Hazen. I think he saw Erwin as his mentor. And, um, and, and Erwin was working on Green Lantern. I mean, there were a lot of characters that they ended up kind of sharing. We were, we were all given different characters. We never made any mention about what we did. We just did them because it paid for money. I probably remember Alex when he came to the office at DC. He, he was like 15, I was 20, 21. He was a, a prepossessing young man, wore knickers, and a skinny, tall guy, very, very low key, ambitious in his own way. I don't know what it was, but he took to my work. What the hell did he see in my work? Not that I'm putting myself down, but I, I, I could, I'm trying to find a thread where he liked my work, because I didn't. I was insecure as hell, and I didn't know what he was coming to me for. I got into the business about the time that the Superman character came out, maybe a little before that. It was the kind of business that most artists who were involved were ashamed to even admit that they were involved in it. In fact, when asked what they were doing for a living, a lot of these guys said, well, I'm a commercial artist. They would never admit that they were drawing for comic books, which was really considered junk stuff, really purely junk stuff. I had a small uh, room in an apartment on Park Avenue and 35th Street in Manhattan. This was before the war. Alex, this skinny kid, would sit down at the table and all of us would just stand over his shoulder and watch as he was working because he was so good at what he was doing. It was a Johnny Thunder story he was doing at that time and he was rendering uh, a sandy, bushy kind of a terrain. And he'd sit there and the pencils weren't even there. And he'd sit there with that brush and with that pen and remarkably do a whole panorama of uh, bushes and cactus and, and horses running and so on. It was just wonderful. And he's like maybe 16 or 17 at the time. loved doing the superheroes, you know, the Black Canary and, and the Green Lantern. But the things at DC were changing. I mean, that period was the end of the 40s where, you know, the comic book business was changing overall, particularly the superhero side of it. And so DC diversified. They ended up doing a lot of westerns, a lot of detectives, and a lot of interesting kind of, you know, diverse subject matter from um, away from the superhero type. He actually was one of the people that helped set the tone and the style of DC for the 50s. He really kind of polished his storytelling. He drew simply, he drew effectively, but more important than anything else, he did what every guy in my business strives to do, and that is that he told the story. He told the story effectively, clearly, with impact, dramatically. I don't care how well you draw, I don't care how beautifully you render, if you ain't telling the story, you're in the wrong business.
I was not in the shooting war in Korea. That had quieted down just as I'd reached Japan in 1956. I believe that we must try to limit the war to Korea for these vital reasons, to make sure that the precious lives of our fighting men are not wasted. They re Arnie recognized very quickly that this guy was a, a brilliant artist. And so uh, he did this newspaper strip for the, for the, for the military guys. But uh, he said, he told me that there were many times he'd be walking through um, the base and people would be saying, well, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? And it thrilled him that uh, he got that kind of instant exposure and reaction from, uh, from his audience. John Fury was a, was a great adventure strip that lasted for, I think, 20 some odd weeks. And I mean, I love Burma Sky because Burma Sky pulls in his love of, of the, the Chenault um, uh, legend and you basically get to take a look at that story. The American Volunteer Group was a group that was, you know, that was uh, formed in like, in, uh, in the summer of 1941. Um, they, were high, they, were, they were pilots and, and ground crew that were taken out of the U.S. military. They were recruited by the Chinese um, as a volunteer air, air group and trained in Burma. And, um, and that, you know, they were, they were under the command of General Chenault, Claire Lee Chenault. And since Alex was stationed in Japan, he wrote to Chenault at his office in, in um, Taipei and said, you know, I, I'm, I'd like to come and interview you when, when, I, when I, you know, at a period when I have leave. These are the days I have leave. Is it possible to get together? And, Chenault wrote back, said, yes, come on down, and, and um, Alex went down there and interviewed him for, uh, for a day and talked to him about the Flying Tigers. He used the medium to tell the story the way he wanted to tell the story. I mean, the air stories, both of them, are very full of sky and very full of specific pinpoint um, uh, uh, illustrations of, of the planes themselves and the pilots and the interior of the cockpit, and you get to feel that you're part of all that stuff. I came home in 1956, moved to LA, I'm married, live in Hollywood, and have four wonderful children. One of the things that I learned about my father that kind of came together for me was that you can't put him in a box, and I think that is one of the most amazing things about him. You cannot say one thing about him without saying another. I remember I don't, I, when Dad was still in the house in Pasadena, I remember him at his drawing board in the back room, looking at his face, looking out the back windows. He had like a, um, it was like a cabinet drawer that he used as a drawing board. And he would always have that in his lap against the drawing board. He never drew on the drawing board. He'd always have it in his lap braced against it. And I can see him in that chair with that, you know, of course the cigarette was on in the ashtray right next to it. I think I had to have been like three or four, but I remember that. I remember trips to the park, black and white photography um, of us in still life. I remember him taking us to the Arboretum. Um, sitting in coffee shops for hours, you know, all the conversations about work. And the, I mean, the one memory I have of Dad, the visual, is just exactly what Damon said. Sitting in that room with all the windows, at the drawing table, with the gray eraser that just gets all the pencil in it, oh, and you right. stretch it out. Stretch it. Yeah. Yeah. And the all mechanical pencils. And, pencils. Yeah. Yep. and yeah. I thought it was so cool, because he yeah. always had that blue mechanical pencil. He did everything with that blue mechanical pencil.
Alex was the most versatile artist ever to work in comics. And his process was pretty simple. Uh, he didn't have these magical tools. You could have dumped him out on a, a desert highway with a pencil and a piece of paper. He would have drawn the same stuff. Everything about him was to, to strive for simplicity. And I think down to the material. Here's the pencil he used, which is a, a wherever brand. I don't know, you can't find these anymore, I suppose. Whatever. <laughs> but uh, yeah, very simple. I mean, it was just the man behind the pencil on a blank piece of paper. It was him. Tools, they do count a lot. Since I doodle with ink pens directly on six by nine pad sheets, I test out many type pens, enjoying learning their working secrets, good, bad, so-so, in casual drawings, doodles. So the first time I actually saw his work where I recognized it was the Adam Flash uh, crossover in Brave Bold because and that was my era. That's, that's the stuff I picked up off the stands. And I looked at it and I thought, this is fun. It seemed to me to be too simple. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I had expected more of it, so I looked to get more out of it but I didn't really get the, the, the impact of it because I was too young to kind of get, you know, the story sense and the flow of the story. He was original, he was unique, and his comic book work, as more people begin to discover more and more, are gonna be just knocked on their, knocked on their cans because there was nobody like him, there's nobody that thought like him, nobody that approached stories like him. Well, this is uh, one of the uh, three pages that I own from the uh, the only solo Batman story Alex ever did, Death Flies the Haunted Skies. And uh, this is page one, which is a pretty famous page. Um, here's a, the hotel, really fancy modern hotel that he designed. And here's the two characters and they're talking. And he's getting ready to uh, open up the curtains and, he's, and he goes, you know, oh no. And then the, the plane flies by and shoots him. And, uh, it kills the people, but you know, he designed these bookshelves, the planes that are here, uh, the character falling backward, her hair. It's like, you know, he has his own design on stuff. This is the next page, which is the splash of Death Flies the Haunted Sky. And, and notice how uh, Alex, this is Batman's cape, and how Alex uh, spelled out Batman in the ripples of the cape. And notice how much depth you get into this picture. He's on top of like a water tower of some kind, and here's a plane flying up towards him. And here's the, uh, here's one more page that he did. This is uh, a later page in the story, but Batman has fallen through the water tower. And Alex, trying to, you know, graphically tell this story, it's like, here's the hole. Here's Batman climbing out of the hole, the hands and, the, you know, the arm. And here's Batman pulling himself up. And there's a headshot, bat, you know, of Batman, you can tell he's hold, he's gripping his arm, so he's kind of in pain. And then here's a full shot. There's a wonderful rhythm that goes with this: the whole, the hands climbing out, the full shot that has been reproduced, reproduced many, many times by other people talking about Toth's work. Of course, if we think about the high point of Toth, like his comics, this might be a bit obscure, but first thing I thought of was this little story called Taps that he did. That's a beautiful what is it, six page story, wordless, very graphic, um, very simple, very quick. It's a beautiful story. The, the argument of the words are drawn and it's something very simple, it's wonderful. an issue of, it was either creepy or eerie, one of the two. There was a black and white story in there by, by some guy named Alexander Toth, and it was the coolest thing. It was so, it was so different from what I was used to. It wasn't Ramita or Busem or Jack Kirby. Um, there was a different feel to it. I think if I had seen it earlier on in my fan days, 
I don't think I, I would have liked it because Alex's work always has a simplicity to it. But as I started doing my own artwork and becoming an illustrator, my style tends to lean toward a very simple look, uh, almost a retro look. And Alex's work sort of had a, a foot in that. It, it sort of had a feel like the stuff I was really into. I enjoyed reading it. I just didn't understand quite why. It took me a while to get to that point. Um, and I think that as I saw more of his work, uh, I got more of a sense of what it was, how it was put together, and how the story flowed. Because really, when you look at it first time, you read the story, and you don't get the fact that you're going with the flow of how the graphics and the story uh, is set up in a, in a kind of a tempo, a visual tempo. You don't get that as a kid. You don't get the sophistication of that. And I think, you know, I was lucky because, because I actually s s you know, got to seek it out, kind of look at his styles in different periods and see the growth in his work. There was something about Alex. He made his mark on everybody, but nobody knows he made his mark on them. You know, it's like Space Ghost and all the cartoons and comic books. He didn't do an extended run on any title. Uh, and ultimately, that's a pro and a con. I think he suffered uh, in the annals of comic book history because of that. But he wanted that. He didn't want to be associated with one character. Instinct, native or developed over years of active creativity in the field, tells you when something's right. like an old pilot's axiom about planes. If it looks good, it'll fly good. Noel Sickles, he was brilliant. So young to have so wise and honest an eye to see through the clutter, the dizzying details, to see the underlying truth of a picture. He did more full-bodied illustration with black, white, and one single medium-toned gray than many a pro with a full color palette. It's like I think with any of us that we grow up with an influence. The people who, who admire and know of Alex and know of the usual sus suspects and uh, the ones that we all knew was Noel Sickles, which was a great influence to him. Um, then came the Milton Kniffs, um, one that was out of left field, which I was almost a little embarrassed and I have not known about him, was a German poster artist called uh, Ludwig Holwein. And, and you actually look at some of Holwein's work and you go, aha, this is where Alex got this. He liked to soak it up like a sponge, all the different arts. And the ones that he loved the most were the ones that he saw what he saw in, in his own art, which was uniqueness, um, originality, um, uh, something that came from the heart that he recognized. Take him out! What is this disturbance? Can't you see I'm having my meal? His favorite picture, obviously, was The Adventures of Don Juan. I think even more so than Robin Hood. And um, he wanted to get a print. And so he got put through this department. He got his print. And that was kind of the end of the good part of the story. Because the thing is, every time he pulled out the print to run it... They would break, you know, because they're so old. It, it would stop. I mean, it would, it, would, it would break the sprockets. It would stop dead. And he'd have to, to take it out and according to family lore. It was like 10 minutes of viewing and then 20 minutes of repair, so 10 minutes of, yeah, yeah. Exactly. cussing oh, in the, the, the cigarette, you know, the above education. the machine, you know, at the elbows, yeah. or, and, you know, you could see it melt on the screen as it just like evaporates, <laughs> you know, and it's just like <laughs> Start. And it would stop and he'd have to refix it again. So it ended up generally getting put back in a box and thrown under the bed and that was it for a while. And he'd pull it out every once in a while. <laughs> I think that, that Alex loved 
the pure thrill of adventure that came out of the 30s and 40s. I mean, if you look at the Seahawk or you look at the adventures of Robin Hood, he grew up in that era. I mean, he was a, a kid when that stuff came out. I mean, it was a perfect thing for him to go to the theater and kind of get enraptured with this whole kind of action adventure between the casting, the cinematography, the scores, you know, the Corn Gold scores uh, and Max Steiner and so on. I can see him uh, um, fencing when he was a kid coming out of the theater. Errol Flynn was so huge and such a, a dashing personality both on and off screen that it just made an impression on him for the rest of his life. And I think he used that as a model, transposing that character into different time periods. You know, Bravo for Adventure is a perfect example. You know, it's, uh, there aren't very many adventure films that, that, um, that Flynn made that, uh, that are period pieces that kind of follow the same tone as Bravo for Adventure. So in essence, he basically took that concept and took it another, another step. So, I mean, you know, from that point of view, it was his ideal, and that's what he used as his model for um, creating his characters. In my, uh, in my opinion, a true cartoonist is one who is looking at reality through the grid of their personal experience, their, their point of view, etc. And they find a way to, to, to translate through their, their hand and their eye the thing that, that is relevant about this, this, this person, this character. A guy like Toth, who's a true cartoonist, can take what they see and find a way to sort of dictate it shorthand, like this kind of two-dimensional Morse code, where with this reduced number of lines, you somehow infuse these, these marks with this energy that not only is yours, but it, it's them. And that's what cartooning is. When I took on the Super Friends in the 1970s in Hanna-Barbera, my aim was to deliver simple, fully drawn, inked and toned boards. I wanted to give them substance and visible continuity, staging, lighting, composition and set designs. It was no more than doing the job right. You can imagine as a kid of four or five years old, the first thing I see on TV is a show like The Batman Show with Adam West um, and then all the Saturday morning TV cartoons that was so popular back then, and one of them was Space Ghost. I was just wowed by it, the, the look, the, the, the voice, the design. And um, around that time, um, uh, DC had put out a DC treasury on the Super Friends, which had a explanation of how TV animation is done. And then I started to link one thing with the other. Oh, who is this man? And sure enough, I would read down there, Alex Toth again. I go, this is, this is just amazing. This, it just, from like five, six, seven, eight years old, it had made just an incredible impression on me. It's funny because, you know, I was a Justice League fan when I was a kid, but I liked the covers more than I liked the interiors. But, you know, I, I realized that it was very difficult to draw all of those characters and, and, and you know, every one of the stories had what, eight and nine characters involved and you had to draw all their costumes and you had to remember what they did and all that stuff. He was able to take all those characters and combine them and, and tell a, a coherent story and keep them all together. It was the first time I was actually satisfied with, with the Justice League. So from my, po my point of view, that's what I kind of sunk my teeth into. I mean, I love Space Ghost and I loved all the kind of stuff that was involved with it. And Hercules was a lot of fun. I mean, most of those stuff was fun but taking something that, that I really knew well and then and enhancing it, boy, for me, that was, that was fabulous. The Space Ghost, that, that was it for me. That and Johnny Quest uh, were the two that, uh, that all the kids in our neighborhood would, would miss. Um, he did work for Hanna-Barbera for a long time. Matter of fact, he met his, his, uh, one of his wives, Gyla, who was an, uh, Joe Barbera's secretary, and she was a very important part of his life. 
That's remember when he do. and Gila got together and he took us to Hanna Barbera, and I remember them showing us how they made the cells, right. and, they, and I remember right. walking around and seeing that, and that was kind of like going to work with Dad and seeing what Dad does. And he also, when I was, boy, it must have been first grade, or first, or maybe it was third. He came to my class. You know, he took requests and did Batman and you know and Superman and different things on the chalkboard. And so all, you know, 15 of us wrote and drew. So he really kind of inspired everybody with that. And that was a point that I really felt, you know, I was very proud to say, you know, my dad helps create, you know, these cartoons. And all the other kids were just like, you know, going crazy. Toth it was in many ways an ideal guy to be designing superheroes for the cartoon medium, especially back in the 60s when everything was very, very stripped down and very much informed by the limited animation process where there was not a, a lot of full animation going on so everything had to be really really simplified and, and but at the same time really dynamic and and graphic and uh, Toth was was the perfect guy for that again because he had a real broad knowledge of of just drawing skills he could draw anything and at the same time he was a real big fan of the more cartoonier comic book artists like the, you know Jack Cole and Roy Crane um, so he was able to simplify his really dynamic drawings down into as few lines as possible, which was exactly what they needed at Hanna-Barbera to, uh, to make the characters animate well, but also still look great. I think the work that he did at h &B is amazing for two different things. First of all, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I'd stop over to see Alex and said, I quit. I mean, he literally, he quit working, and Joe would always ask him to come back. And the reason why he always asked him to come back is he knew that, that Alex was one of the best people he had working for him, and that he always had great ideas. And I think it's because he understood the milieu. He understood the whole part of the superhero and the action hero. And, um, and it was his training at DC probably more than anything else that got him to understand it. And he, and he knew the mythos of all of those characters. Portraying that in a graphic sense um, was something that he was a master at. It's Ever great. since I was a kid. I mean, I can remember seeing Herculoids in Space Ghost and just being struck by the design, like literally, like crazy things like the weird spaceships he'd make and the aliens. And there was something distinctive about it. Toth was, he was kind of an influence on, this, on the style that we came up with for Batman the Animated Series, but it wasn't like I had a bunch of Alex Toth drawings around me as, as I was designing Batman. It was more of a feeling. Um, Batman's pose in particular, the way he's kind of standing with his chest out and his, his feet back. And, um, it, it's definitely a, um, a subconscious but deliberate, you know, um, space ghost kind of feel. But like I said, it wasn't that it, it, it wasn't like I had Alex Toth's drawings in front of me and I was trying to copy them. It was more I was trying to get a, a kind of Toth-like feel, um, but still within my own style. With long and short stints at Hanna-Barbera, I've drawn storyboards, scene layouts, designed heroes, heroines, villains by the hundreds, ditto incidental characters, gadgets of every type, use, size, and shape, and otherworldly origin, locales and backgrounds, costumes, sets, props, effects, full color art presentations, etc., etc. Well paid for all, well treated too. What I'm holding is actually the original um, pages and drawings that Alex did to describe the process of TV cartoons, which came out in that DC Treasury I was saying earlier. When he hit his prime in the 60s, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, he nailed it down to its bare essence. And um, going to Hanna-Barbera or any TV studio at the time, um, he was the perfect person to be a designer because he did he did eliminate as much as he could and all you had there was the, the the enough lines to make that animation work as time went on he was able to, to apply the disciplines he learned from from the graphic side of the business from the the graphic novel side or the comic book side of you know the character breaking it down into 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 black and white and light and dark and being able to use that in his animation designs. And the interesting thing is, I mean, if you look at his storyboards, the storyboards that he created for all of those things, all of those shows are far more complex in terms of direction than, than the storyboards of the time. And if you look at them today, they're better than most of the storyboards you see 
that give complex direction for both for 2D and CGI work today. He had a wonderful design sense. And so <clears throat> I just would talk, you know, not really just about anything about the show. What I remember mostly was just that, you know, wow, I got, uh, we got layouts from Alex and his crew and, and you know, I said, this is going to be a snap, you know, <laughs> because he was so clean and precise in what he delivered to us. And I can't tell you what a personal satisfaction it is to me now to own these. You know, um, I was uh, amazed one day when visiting with Alex that he pulled these out and he had them. And, uh, of course, I had to have them myself. <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, here they are. Uh, thankfully, uh, you know, we made an agreement and, and uh, I refer to these every so often, take them out and get all inspired all over again like as if, as if I was a kid. I, I wouldn't be surprised if major filmmakers in Hollywood and, ab and abroad uh, 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 look at this and point at this saying this is a source of inspiration because it has the whole process. And uh, Alex had a temperament and a personality where he was very meticulous and, and it shows in here because he didn't leave a dot or a comma out e explaining the process. So my sleepless nights, miles of cigarettes, and oceans of coffee didn't go for naught. Well worth the effect it had on production. I was fortunate enough to get him to do a few pieces over the years. I was always trying to get him to do a story, an eight-page story for Batman Black and White. So I said, well, do, the, do a cover for me at least. Um, and he said, okay, I can do that. And I got, right away, I got this piece in the mail. It was so simple, it was, so, it was all there. You couldn't move a single line, you couldn't move a shape, or you'd totally screw it up. Alex actually got better as he got older. He was in his 70s and he was better than he ever was. Toth is always referred to uh, quite often as the, the artist's artist. He was such a spectacular artist. He, he was the, the complete artist. He, he was uh, um, grounded in, in illustration and, and comics and um, was, a, was a killer draftsman. And at the same time, he applied a really simplistic or simplified um, style to his drawing ability. I think this is one of the reasons why other artists just revere him. Just how he laid out a page in his artwork is, uh, gosh, a design epitome of, of just perfection. Even the lettering, because he did all his own lettering. And this stems back from way, way in his early childhood because he started doing comics in his teens. He was taught by the old timers that you had to do it all. You know, you had to learn to do it all. And you know, from the penciling to the inking to the lettering, to the rendering, to the logos, to everything. So he got to a point where his design sense was immaculate. It is the simplicity of the design and the following the movement and feeling as though you're part of the story as opposed to just looking at the story. And the command of the page in terms of being able to break down the, the story and then simplify each of the movements so that you actually follow it in the tempo that he's designed is just breathtaking. But I also think that he looked at black and white in terms of the way, and color, the way it, it, it blended on the page to design that page so that you follow, because that's part of the design sense of being able to figure out timing. He wanted to know how everything worked. Uh, take a plane, for instance. He knew everything from the, from the cockpit to the propeller to the, the rivets, he knew everything about that and it, it was fascinated by it. And the more he knew about it, the, the better he could draw it. I asked him once because I, I was so impressed. You must have had in the 60s uh, several sets of encyclopedias or whatnot. And he said, no, I, I did it all out of memory. One of the times I went to visit him, he had a, uh, 
he had a stack of National Geographics on a table, on a coffee table, and he had this huge magnifying glass. And I said, what are you doing? And he goes, well, they got these articles on the, on the Mayans, and I'm just fascinated with it. So he would get this magnifying glass out, and he would look at the photographs trying to extract as much information as he possibly could. Um, it was, and, and all, that always struck me because he was so into get, getting as much information and knowledge as he could. He had a photographic memory. I'm an interested observer, a fan now, and it's enough for me. I've said it all, done it all, with nothing more to say, so I've just shut up. I enjoy all the reprints of old classic comics. The best is behind us. I was always very nervous to show him my artwork. You know, he knew I was an artist, but he didn't. I, I really intentionally kept my artwork away from him. The worst thing in the world would be for God to not like my artwork. Alex told me this story. He said that when he moved to California, um, he got a call from this guy Jack Kirby. He, did, he knew Jack's work, but he, did, he had never met Jack. And Jack said to him, Alex, this is Jack Kirby. Um, I really love your work. And so many people say that you and I are the two main guys in the industry, and everybody else falls into place behind us. Whether or not that's true, I want to learn why you do certain things. I want to know what you do. When do you come over? And so it was a short drive. Alex hopped in his car and went over. Roz Kirby made hamburgers, they, and Jack and, and Alex sat out by the pool. And I remember Alex saying this. He said, so we're sitting there eating hamburgers, and Jack says, OK, I'm going to tell you exactly what I do and why I do it. And here it is. And for the next 35, 40 minutes, Jack spoke about everything he knew about his art and everything he knew about comic books and storytelling. And Alex said to me, Mark, I didn't understand a freaking word he said. And then I did my 45 minutes. And the look on Jack's face, I could tell he didn't understand a word I said. Our approaches were so different. So I thanked him for the hamburger, thanked his wife, and I got up and I left. I was at his house once, which, oh my gosh, it was like, it's so dark. He has all the blinds drawn and he's got the books everywhere. And he's like, Dana, over on the bookcase. And I'm going, I could barely see the bookcase. Over on the bookcase, see that picture over there that Eric did, da, 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 would you go get that for me? And I'm, I'm basically walking over there like this and he's yelling at me, no, no, no. And I finally turned around and I said, Daddy, I can't see what you see. And then all of a sudden it hit him like, oh, you're normal. Oh, honey, I'm sorry. But he really expected this level of whatever and I would have to remind him, I'm not you, even though I'm 30 years younger than you. Or what, I cannot see that. I cannot. And he would know exactly where something was. He'd say, go to that stack over there, third from the bottom. There should be a photography book. I want you to have it. Sure enough, I'd go over there, count, you know, and it would be there. He was amazing. I'd be like, hey, I found this book. I want you to have it. And he, you know, it's, he's, you know, thanks very much. But did you notice on page 72, the, whoever printed this book and did the pre-production, the image is actually upside down. I'd be like, what? Take a look. He's like, these halftones are really badly reproduced. There's a 5% gray behind this. It should be white. He didn't, they didn't push the exposure high enough. And my God, he's right. He could talk about anything. He was so well-versed. He was such a voracious reader. Everything from fine art to, to uh, the new cute actress in Hollywood. He knew everything. The guy was such a font of information. And he was so versed on so many subjects. He just was, since he was such a voracious reader and so curious about so many things that um, it, he could just go from subject to subject or person to person, whatever he could connect with. The guy was a genius. He was an absolute genius. And I know that word is thrown around a lot, but you have to say that about Jack Kirby and Crum, Robert Crum and Alex Toth. Roy Crane, to whom I wrote 10-page, double-sided, gushing letters, asking a thousand questions and pouring out observations, assumptions, etc. He soon tired of it. Set me straight. You know, Alex, if you'd write shorter letters, you get more replies. That, folks, is how I came to jot postcard responses. Well, this is 
This is some of the correspondence, you know, I've received over the last 20 to 25 years. He sent me these postcards for 20 years, back and front, overlapping into the stamp. He lived for his mail, and he loved mail. Uh, he was, I know it's very old-fashioned now, everybody's email or whatever, but I was always a letter, letter writer, and, uh, and Alex was the, the king of letter writing. He know it would be big to get the mail, so if yeah. he wasn't able to go do it himself, he'd ask if we could just go down and get it for him. But he'd get very excited when he saw something, you know, somebody's letter, and then, oh, I got something from someone. He'd open it yeah. right away, and he'd yeah. pour over it. Yeah. I mean, just soaking it all up. He had all these, these connections with people going on, some through letters with us or some through the phone. So really, he had an amazing life for all the, the things that maybe were hard for him to do in life. Uh, he had an amazing life, and he did touch people. Once I became a real big hardcore fan of Alex's work, I started collecting everything he ever, he ever drew, and there's a lot of it out there. Um, and um, a good friend of mine said, yeah, I hear that, you know, I know somebody who wrote to Toth, and uh, Alex really likes to correspond. You should write him and tell him how big a fan you are. And I wrote to Alex. I wrote, you know, a stupid, you know, shaky fan kid letter. Uh, even though I was in my 20s. Um, and sure enough, he wrote back. He wrote, he sent back one of these little postcards with a duck, a drawing of a duck on it. And he really, you know, he really liked what I had to say. And um, he suggested in the, le in, the, in the postcard that I, that we correspond, that we continue to correspond. Somehow the, the humanity, the fact that he had kids and raised kids, and I knew these guys were human beings. It's like, you know, there's a chance he might write back. You know, what do I have to lose? So. I don't even remember what I wrote, but I, you know, I'm sure I sent a pretty, you know, sincere, heartfelt fan letter. I, I imagined from all the stories that I had heard, oh, he's like Rip Van Winkle, and he's got long hair, and he's got nails that long, you know, it's a foot long or whatever. And um, I was a nervous wreck one day, but I said, well, I'm going to muster up the, you know, the courage to go and see him. I mean, he's literally about five, ten minutes away. I gotta go do this, I gotta do this, I gotta get out of my system and at least meet the man that's inspired me so much. Well here that was this handsome old man in a robe and you know, and asking me, well who are you and what do you want, sort of thing. Well I proceeded just to babble and go, well I'm you know, so and so, I'm a big fan of your work, I figure we're so close. I just stopped by and said quick hello, etc, etc. And all I got from him was, I don't receive unsolicited visitors. And slam, <laughs> close the door in my face. And I was like, oof, like, you know, there with a cold bucket of water over me. Um, so I walked away from that kind of shaken, but actually something in me was more determined than ever to get to know him. I remember being over his place and we were talking for a couple hours and I said, you know, I, I, I've never seen you draw what do you do a drawing? I want to watch you draw. And he's like, get out of here. Get, you know, and we started, we continued our conversation. And about a half hour later, he said, come on, draw me something. And he, so he got up. He, he used to draw on, the, on his kitchen table. He had this TV set right in front of him. And he had all these magazines stacked up. And he's kind of, he was really pissed off at me. And he's looking, oh, you pain in the ass. And he started drawing this guy, this guy's head. It was like a gangster's head. And on the bottom, and it was just, it's really interesting to watch an artist draw. And he would, he put this little line for the back of the head, then he put the nose in, and then he put the chin in, and the, it was like he was projecting it onto the paper and just tracing where it was. And he did it with a marker, he didn't, he didn't pencil it out first. It was really magical, it was, it was incredible, and I still have the, I still have the piece. Um, but then on the bottom he wrote, to Chirello, you pain in the ass. <laughs> you know, it was great, and he gave it to me. So I let a little time pass, and I started writing him. And I didn't tell him I was that guy at the front door or whatnot. I just said, what the heck, I'm just going to write him. And we started corresponding. And one day he just write, writes me, he says, well, why don't you come by on Saturday afternoon and uh, we'll visit for a little while, which grew into a wonderful friendship. But never once did I ever tell him that I was that guy. Through a mutual friend of ours, Mark Chiarello at DC Comics, um, I, um, I, I got to correspond with Alex um, because he was really good friends with Mark and I was good friends with Mark and, and Mark knew I was a fan of Toast and so he, he got us in touch with each other and you know I, I sent him a fan letter and 
the weirdest thing in the world, you know, like, you know, days later, I actually got a fan letter back from him. And it was like, you know, wow, we would talk about lots of different subjects. He was, you know, he had a, a real magpie kind of mind, you know, he was interested in lots of little things, and he would grab things and, you know, and store them in the back of his head. And all of a sudden, you'd get like this five page letter talking about, you know, Italian sports car design, or, you know, full figured women. And uh, he was a real, uh, a real raconteur. The great thing about Alex was, he really didn't want to talk about comic books that much. He wanted to talk about Gustav Klimt and Holwine and N.C. Wyeth and Al Parker and Kobe Whitmore. We've, we had a million conversations about Amer American illustrators of the, of the 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, yeah, we've, we had a lot of good conversations. Of course, it ended badly. Very, very important to him was um, keeping your word, trust, um, respect, and no funny business. As soon as he caught you in any one of those, that's where the legendary Alex would appear. He'd blast you. I don't care if you were the President of the United States or if you were the kid down the street. It didn't matter because he pointed out to you in no uncertain terms. It was right around the time that we were doing the Superman animated series um, and we got into a disagreement about my approach to the Superman animated series and uh, I mean he kept insisting that it should have been exactly like the old Fleischer cartoons and I really didn't want to do that. I wanted to do my own take on it and so you know he, he was like you know sending me these letters that were just critiquing the show like you know kind of mercilessly. I uh, we we had a we were friends for about 18 years, and we had a falling out at the at, about two years ago. And um, he was a jerk. He was being a jerk. <laughs> I kind of expected it because I'd talked to other people who were friends with him or had been friends with him, where he just kind of like cut them off cold someday. Alex was the only person, by the way, that could yell at you in a letter. This was him yelling. When you get this kind of stuff in the mail from a guy that's like your friend, um, at first you're shocked. But then you just start laughing. Because imagine a guy spending that much time and that much effort and that much anger vending himself on a piece of paper. Now, on one hand, he, he, liked to, um, he would like to argue points, but at the same time, he would get frustrated and just say, no, I'm right, you're wrong, go away. I think the thing about Dad is when you are that way, you don't realize that the rest of the world isn't. So you don't know how to gauge what somebody in a different capacity, you know, is able to comprehend or respond to or remember. Um, all you know is that it's frustrating to you. I was probably about 23, 24. And um, I sent him just the latest pack of stuff and, you know, typical. And he wrote back his his, uh, I don't want to say usual critique, but he wrote back, you know, a di it was the dialogue, he, you know, he dialogued. So I got the letter back, and at the end of it, very abruptly, last two lines, you know, okay, kid, I've had a gut full of you. Now go, go, go work. You know, I don't have anything else left to tell you, go work, and come back when, when you have something to show me. And that was the way it ended. I never wrote him back. Although I never met Gaila, uh, he talked of her like that, that was the love of his life, his inspiration. They were so close and so in love. She was a really neat lady and she was, she was really good to like Eric and I because at that time Dana and Carrie were older and weren't probably visiting. Like we'd go over for the weekend like Eric and I and stay with them. But Gaila would like help us with our homework, stay on top of like a real mother, you know, she's like she really good to us. She treated sweet. us like one of her own. She, she was a, a neat, neat lady. Yeah. She had amazing spirit. She had a, yeah. a, a yeah. little yeah. giggle. A little she could giggle. prod dad into, he'd be all gruff and grumpy and she, oh Alex, and she'd just giggle. And she had just a way about yeah. her that mm -hmm. was very good with him. Mm -hmm. And, um, and try to get him out of his little ruts. He had a great deal of love and respect for her, but he also realized that 
if she wanted something and she was going to make a and press the point that he should probably give on it I think he really he adored her yeah she was really his match um, and yet you know there are times where where it was overwhelming for her too in terms of again living her life she's fiercely independent she would take trips with her best friend all around the world and dad and her also took a few trips they went to England um, yeah. they did a couple trips around uh, Europe together Australia or Fiji so they, they did some things together but if he didn't wasn't up for doing it she would go on her own or go with her friends which you know is is really admirable um, but you know, I, I mean, I have an image when we'd stay over there. Uh, Dad would always watch the news at 11 and then the Johnny Carson show. And so, I mean, we'd always stay up. We could stay up as late as we wanted to. And about 10 o'clock or 1030, she'd get up, she'd come over, she'd kiss Dad goodnight and walk, say goodnight and go up the stairs. And mm -hmm. we'd be up until whenever. And we'd go to bed and then Dad would be up until whenever. So yeah. she just she would be on that couch. She would either knit glass, or read and have a little glass, glass of wine. wine and just the sweetest giggle and she called we'd call it Gila's Ocean daddy would say we're gonna yeah. go see Gila's Ocean and we'd always go find a restaurant on the water for her I, I can still see her on that couch she'd have her glasses at the end of her nose and she'd be reading and every once in a while her eyes she had nice big round eyes her eyes would pop up and look up at dad and kind of make this little giggle and then go back to reading yep. her book and could still see her there as if yeah. it were like yesterday. I don't know if it was because he mellowed later in life or, or if he had figured out what he wanted in a relationship or, um, I mean, there's lots of stuff that I don't know the answers to. I know that, you know, he might get a little fussy and then she'd be a little more stern, but she didn't raise her voice. She'd just be emphatic and he'd go, okay, dear. When she was in the hospital and stuff, he, he, I think he had a lot of, a lot of guilt of like, he felt like he didn't do enough. And yeah. da for dad, again, like Damon said, he, and it was interesting because he couldn't engage with his, with his intellect on that subject of, of what to do in terms of, of her health and what are the options, who are the other doctors. He never really trusted doctors. And I think he was overwhelmed by it. She was living on, on limited f foods that she could eat without getting sick. And she always, always would put that way in the back. But so he felt helpless. And too, during that, that period, um, the, the 70s, the 80s, when someone would pass away, like a mentor in, in a lot of cases, um, he saw it as, as tragic. Instead of it just being a part of you know, life, which it really is, especially if someone, you know, has lived a full life and because, you know, it struck him in his own mortality. It seems just months ago, but last Easter was a year since Milt Kniff died. And I just heard of Mike Sikowski's death in surgery last 31 March, this following Frank Giacoya's passing a, a month before. Contemporaries and colleagues of mine, the world shrinks as does time and options. There's part of his life that was completely lived to the fullest, and then there's so much of his life that was that I think that he had regret about internally that he didn't necessarily express. But then his <laughs> mom passed away in, I think, 91, and he said after that, he put the car in the garage and he never left, mm -hmm. and he didn't. And he that's said he, when he didn't have a reason anymore because yeah, he would to go leave. Out every was, weekend. He would go to, he would visit, to visit his her mom in mm -hmm. Pasadena, and we a lot of times would would still go over on our own. I also think that that's part of that kind of mind. When you talk about genius, typically there is some of that going on. When he when he was challenged with that, it affected his life in every way, and there were times when it consumed him. My wife Gyla's passing has left an unfillable hole in my life. And I'm not certain I want to even try to fill it. Nothing, no one, can ease the ache nor the loneliness of life without my Kansas girl's warm giggle to brighten my days. I know that, that when, when he lost Gyla, it was a huge blow to him. I think that it basically shut down uh, uh, more than he, he realized and, and continued to change 
how he viewed life, and eventually that's how he basically kind of withdrew from, from you know, the rest of the world and stayed at home for the rest of his life. Even leading up before Gaila passed away, he, he was already showing the tendencies of, of withdrawing. I mean, already in his career, I think, you know, he had done that. And he always was very troubled by the things that are going on in the world, the negative things. And so for him to just shut himself out in some ways of the pain of all of that and the loved ones that had died, then his house just became this safety zone for right. him. And that everything was. he loved was truly right there. The TV, the radio, being books, able to write magazines. books, artwork, cigarettes. It was, um, it was interesting, because when, when Gala was there, it was a whole different world, you know? It was, there was more of a, uh, a male dominance of the house with no woman to clean it up after him. And, and Alex generally didn't throw anything out. I mean, he'd keep, the envelopes that stuff came in so that he had the return address. And it started gradual. I remember visiting and he'd say, I go, Dad, let me just clean up for you. Because you go in there and there's dust all over. Let me, no, no, no. He goes, yeah, I know. And he'd make a joke. My dust bunnies have dust bunnies. You know, and, and, it, and then, you know, the nicotine on the walls from smoking. But he almost made it like, don't touch it, that would make me uncomfortable. It just started falling apart, and it was always, it amazed me, when you don't, when you don't, would not do any work to something, how quickly it basically falls apart. The, the amazing yeah. thing, when, as a kid, he's like, you know, as long as you're doing the dishes, take the dish rack and clean the chrome oh, faucet, it's like, so he clean. immaculate, and then it could, you step in his house, you're 20 yeah. years later, and you're like, well, what happened here, but you he know? Was, he was, but he yeah, was, he was always very like, clean. But he just shut down. And um, I, I, I'm very fortunate to have been part of that, you know, those last several years to at least share something of the outside world in his little back cave, as he called it, at home, to give him some sort of life or inspiration to, to carry on. I'm a mess doing my best to heal. Day by day, changes up and down. So, don't know how I am. Had family in and out, doing marvelous favors for me for days. So, I'm humbled, grateful for all they did. Hell of a group, the Toths. Work hard at doing good. He knew leaving the house in Hollywood was very important and he had to do it. But he, um, uh, it meant that he had to deal with being in the hospital. It knew, you know, they were going to try to help him, but, you know, he was, he had a lot of damage had been done by that time. We really had a, I mean, he realized that, that, that it was the night before, it was like an intervention. Um, I flew in, Carrie flew in, um, and we all just showed up. And he, you know, and his movement was a little limited, but he, he kind of looks at all of us and he, He's like, yeah. and I, I think he, I don't know if he started to cry, but he realized what was going to happen. Yeah. And, um, and then there were some, of the, so we all, you know, stood, stood around and you know, put our hands on him. And, um, he just, he, he knew, and he knew the love that was there. And then uh, my mom called oh, and talked to him, and, he, and he's just like, Oh, you know, Chris, thanks for calling. And it's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep, yeah, they're all here. And, you know, it was just, it was just the way it needed to be, and it was, it was perfect. Um, and he just, he did it. He appreciated it, but he wrote me this incredible letter about just being so angry at, that his, at the way his situation was. And I don't think it was for selfish reasons. I think he was angry because um, he had become a grandfather, and he wanted to see his, his kids his grandkids grow up. 
and he got to see them. Uh, he got to meet them. Uh, he got to know them a little bit in the last last two years of his life. And, uh, and he wanted to stick around, uh, not for him, but, but for his family and for his, uh, for his grandkids, which I thought was wonderful. And that's what he did in those last two years, is get back to the, the whole person, you know, and not the one who only looked at things that are negative, but that who started to look at the, the beauty. The thing about dad was in some ways he pretended like he didn't need anybody, but the truth is he hung on all of those things and his life, he had let his life whittle down to such a small, small exposure to the people that he cared about that he hung on getting a letter, getting a phone call, getting a visit. That's yeah. the highlight of his day. He looked at life differently. And I think that he was far more appreciative. He wanted to see people. Um, and he actually left his room, went out to the balcony and looked at the flowers and wanted to go for walks and actually went to the Chinese restaurant and did all the kinds of things that you would always kind of wanted to expect him to do. It was two years ago for his birthday when it was Reuben and, and uh, my wife and my son and dad for his birthday. And, uh, I, never, uh, okay. I just never thought I'd be in the restaurant again with him. And I said to Reuben, for that only, it was worth getting him out of the house. I see a smile. When he got sick, when he eventually got real sick and he knew where things were going to go, he made up with a lot of people. Um, and um, Ruben said, you know, Alex really regrets him being an ass to you. Uh, maybe you can write him a letter and say hi. And I did. I wrote him a letter. Um, I knew he was going to die. And I wrote him a letter. and. He died right after I wrote him, a couple weeks after I wrote him. And five days after he died, I received a letter from him. And I was like, it was the weirdest thing. Because I had received hundreds of letters from this guy all, you know, for years and years. And this was after he was dead, and it was strange. And it was a really sweet letter. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't apologize for his behavior, but he came as close as Alex Toth could. And man, that meant a lot to me. That really meant a lot to me. I was sitting on a computer, um, and I just I got an instant message from somebody saying he had died. And uh, the uh, the the thing about it that was fitting, I suppose, was that I was working that day. I was working on uh, turnaround model sheets for an animated film, which you know is what he was doing. So and for a lot of his career, so. In a way, you know, it felt sort of like there was a weird sort of resonance with that moment in time, you know. At his age, although he had a rough, tough life and, and did so many things, at age 77, I think he had more in him. I think he could still be here today. I treasure those phone calls where he'd call me and I think I'll always miss him. Um, I'll miss getting his cards. I'll miss, um, you know, like I said, he can yell at you in print. There's nobody that could do that but Alex. Um, I miss uh, talking to him on the phone. Um, the mailbox is always empty. Uh, I haven't started writing or corresponding with anybody since. I love his friends. I, I mean, they're my family, and not just because of what we, we've gone through. If I met them in a room by myself, I would want to be with them. Yeah. Yeah, and really, to say, you know, th those friends who, who have overcome the, the abuse at times, you know, were, because they're close and more intimate, you know, they, they knew them. It's amazing how many people I've met where they've either had correspondence, but they either hadn't talked to them or, or met them in person. 
in but over like 15 years or they've only met him once right and you know that they still even had this connection with him not just as a fan but as you know as, as a person who cared about him and then the really close friends who were able to, to be there and who stuck it out because you know we've we've struggled with it and he was our father so imagine a friend how easy it would be and some people have chosen yeah, that to just, just say to you know I can't do this anymore because mm -hmm. it really you know it could be that tough he was he was just a really interesting remarkable um, sweet sweet guy but at the if you hit him at the wrong time he, he really could be a, he really could be a handful ladies and gents what it all boils down to is this we all essentially learn the same skills, sets of rules, no-nos, to do our jobs, like the keyboard of a piano. What all the octaves are, middle C is, where, and black and white keys, and foot pedals, and how and why and when to use them to make music. How you apply it all and exercise it, refine it, is your lifelong quest of your craft, as you, no matter who taught or influenced you, it is up to you to make the most of it, your way. And enjoy the mix of countless influences that will sustain you. It's how we best learn our lessons in life, no kidding. From there on, you're on your own. I have a lot of memories that don't go away. Every time he sees a blank sheet of paper, he tries to fill it up. Jesus, you're getting me to fall in love with him all over again. He's reincarnated. We get him, we get him in Bruce Tim. We get him in Darwin. And the, eventually the thing that, you get him in me, I suppose, but the thing that, the thing that um, eventually happens is the, the personality maybe it's not there, but like the, the lesson. And I think that's one thing that I, I like about the fact that the, the, the things that he was telling all of the young guys he talked to, whether it's me or you know, whoever else, it's the same message. To me, that he was always talking about keeping it simple. You just keep it simple um, and keep it honest. He was able to reduce the elements of his composition to its simplest forms. I think if anything, that's one reason I take, even though it's a bit of a pain in the ass, like you take the time to talk to young guys and encourage them. Because if it wouldn't have been for Toth, it wouldn't have been for Dave McKean and Steve Ditko, a couple other guys who took the time to really help. You know, I, I don't know what I would have done because otherwise you're out, in the, you're out in the wilderness. It was like having a, a good friend and a colleague down the street and go over there and we both cry on each other's shoulders sort of thing or share what we were both, both going through. People just loved him. They loved his artwork, but uh, something inside of him wouldn't, couldn't enjoy it. I always felt like he was my friend, and uh, and I don't think there were a lot of people that could actually could say that for that period of time. But he was always worth any of the effort that you that he put you through. Um, he did a lot of incredibly generous things that nobody really knows about. But he he would do them because he was a he was a really good guy. Um, he went from a man who never left his house to a man that not only left his house but left those belongings and trusted us with those belongings because they certainly couldn't all come with him. He went from a man who never apologized to a man who did apologize. He went from a man that didn't answer the door, didn't let other people in, didn't answer the phone if he didn't feel like it, to answering the phone even when he felt horrible and putting a note on the door if he didn't feel like being disturbed but letting people come in and out of his room every single day. To me, that is an amazing human being. I, as much as I yearn and miss him I, and wish he was still here, you know, he's left so many beautiful memories and a legacy that it's just incredible. When I think about this, you, you, you think, did he have a happy life? That's the real question. I think that there were times when he worked, he, 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 he did great work and he knew it. And I think he had, was able to feel what that felt like. And he has a family and I think that's important. 
you know, for any person. I think that he knows he has a legacy. He knows there, there are guys out here that he touched. Simplicity. Can't you fools understand simplicity?